Go out. Yeah. What are you doing with the Daily Worker? Your net must have left it here. Your boyfriend reads the Daily Worker? What is he, a communist? <laughs> he reads everything, you know. Ned's very well read. Maybe he's just very well read.
Hello. Welcome in. Damn, that fucking intro hits like a beast. It's so good. Hayes did such a great job on that. Yeah, he did. I love it. Okay, so today we have, well, me. Hi, I'm Sal. Um, and then we have Frog and JJ. And we are talking about nukes. <laughs> Okay. I can hear um, when they blast the shit in my ears. <laughs> okay. You got it up? Are you there? Hello? Huh? What? Did you see it? What am I what, what am I looking at? I what mean, are we it, doing? Is this did the screen properly share? No, I don't see anything. Hey, JJ, you're muted by the way. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Oh. Hello. <laughs> It's all right. I silenced myself. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Grom Storino, for the raid. We saw that. We appreciate you. Grom Storino is based. And definitely go follow them. So, I don't know if you guys know about the, um, like, history of nukes and how they were kind of like tested on whoever willy-nilly but that's what we're gonna talk about tonight and we're gonna watch some some videos and, and talk about it so yeah and Sounds we're fun. also going to um talk a little bit about the nuclear family or is it the atomic family or the nuclear family either way one of those families <laughs> nuclear family i think I like the atomic family. <laughs> right? <laughs> Mass destruction. Yeah. Remix. Okay. But welcome in, Marks. Uh, Kuki. Oh, hey! Kuki is here. Gramsterino. No quiche. V. Future aristocracy. Okay. Quiche is the goat. So we have Bikini Atoll. Should we go over Bikini Atoll? Or we can do... Which one of these looks um, interesting to you guys? Uh, bikini is interesting. I know I've, I've read about that before. Do you have videos for it? Yep, we do. We have like a 40 minute long like kind of documentary on it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Sarah, I think you we're already Posadist, aren't we? Yeah. Isn't this a Posadist stream? <laughs> well. Wait, it's not? Oh, damn. I'm gonna go <laughs> run into moving traffic now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jordan, Listen, feels I've been looking about it. Uh, I've already been working on organizing the Dolphin Vanguard, so. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Arf, arf. My whole vision in Let life was to live on a deserted, tropical South Pacific island. Watch out what you tell the Lord. <laughs> America tried to bury its toxic legacy here on a remote coral atoll. They covered it over with an 18-inch thick dome and left. Now the sea is rising and the dome is leaking. And the men who tried to clean it up are dying. I think it's a total secret. We didn't even know. The guys didn't know. We were so this is like prevalent, right? Like so they are testing these nukes on people who don't know. And they're making these soldiers take care of this waste, right? And they don't know. And they're getting cancer. 
I don't know. Lied to. It's wild. Tonight, we journey to one of the most contaminated places on Earth, and we meet the people fighting back. You know, if you accept that you're doomed, then what is left to fight for? You know, where are you going to find hope? We need the Can you put the volume on the video up a little bit, Sam? Um, it's cr fully cranked, but I don't right. know what I can do. Here, hold on. Did this help? Look he's doing. Yeah. Oh, please, look at us. It's pretty catchy music for such a somber topic. <laughs> yeah. We're halfway between Australia and Hawaii, in the middle of a seemingly endless Pacific Ocean. Below us, chains of mostly uninhabited islands that together form the nation of the Marshall Islands. Well, we've just passed Bikini Atoll, known around the world for 23 atomic tests during the 1940s and 50s. But where we're going is much more remote, a place where nearly twice as many tests were carried out, some the biggest in human history. Spread over 2 million square kilometres of the Central Pacific, the Marshall Islands is a scattering of more than a thousand islands and islets. Few people have heard of Eniwetok, but it's the ground zero of US nuclear testing in the Pacific. The welcome sign hints at what we've come to see, but when you know what it really is, few would want to visit this place. Jesus. This atoll is a ring of 40 islands so remote that there's no regular transport in or out. It'll be a week before our plane returns, if we're lucky. It's a stunning place, <laughs> but its beauty hides a dark, dirty secret. That's really sad. This is a place whose atomic past is seared into its present. The people of Eniwetok were forced into exile by the atomic fallout. Allowed to return after three decades, a new generation is learning about the traditions and customs of this place. They have also been taught about America's toxic legacy and how it lies under a giant dome. That's much more positive. Oh my god. That's funny. They can't hear you, Sal. I know. I just read Ghost Scrubs out loud and then I realized I was on mute because I'm a pro streamer. Okay. Tomorrow they understand that we have a bison in our island. That is what they call bison. They know that there's a doom because they have been there. So the dome, you call it the tomb. Mm, we call it the tomb. So also, if you don't know where the name Bikini came from, it came from Bikini Atoll. That's we set out the next morning to see. I, I also like to believe that to Bikini that, Bottom and SpongeBob know how to takes place underneath Bikini world. Atoll, and That's then like all the all such the a good like <laughs> lore. Holy shit! And all you know, and that that's why they have all these like animals that are you know like humanoid fish and stuff because of the uh, the radiation. <laughs> Fuck yeah! That's some like Adventure Time like type shit. I like that. Oh god. <laughs> That's somber. Hillenberg kind of hinted at it, not going to lie. Nice. 
I didn't realize there was such a dark history to the bikini. Yes. Yep. War to Rex. Bikini bottom is a testing site right here. <laughs> I always knew Mr. Krabs was a Nazi. Where we're going. We have to cross <laughs> the world's Too soon? second largest ocean lagoon, <laughs> formed by the rim of an ancient volcano. It's a thousand square kilometers <laughs> of the Pacific. SpongeBob takes place directly after World War II. <laughs> after nearly two hours, we approach one of Inuitok Atoll's So is Plankton, islands, like, a tiny the hero of the proletariat in that case? <laughs> no, it's Squidward. Yes, he works at the Chum Bucket. Don't what you know socialism is when no money? <laughs> We've been over this frog. Can you get a true <laughs> revisionist pick. I, I forgot. Of what the United yeah. States military calls <laughs> the Dome. Squidward is a comrade. The Squidward is, is relatable. A dump. For true. It contains the toxic leftovers of some of the most powerful atomic bombs in history. America's Cold War legacy. It is a tomb of nuclear waste. The dome is a completely of uh, unlabeled. Waste. There's no fence. There are no guards there. People can are there go Ninja there Turtles? if they want. Probably. And there's nobody to stop them. Like other former nuclear test sites in the Marshall Islands, Runet Island is officially off limits. True, Chun but there's no one here to stop us when we visit. Chun this place is just too isolated to guard. Is Patrick Lumpen Pro? <laughs> 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 From 1946 to 1958, the United States detonated dozens of atomic think, bombs. That's actually in the a pretty Island. good assessment, I think. Especially because he's so, like, fickle. He can become a revolutionary or a reactionary or just whatever. Because mm. he's so unaware of everything, he'll just go with the flow. Which is kind of what what Marx, uh, Marx's critique was of the lumpen. Patrick is the Vosh of Bikini Bottom. <laughs> Whoa. Patrick watches Fox News. He probably does watch Fox News. Gonna hey, SpongeBob. Oh my god. Sarah's going to ban the word Vosh in here. <laughs> Fine, I'll just call him Ian. He looks like an Ian. Ian. Islands. So, so Sandy would be an imperialist, right? In a or a colonizer? Oh, for sure. Oh, we already knew that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Patrick is anti-vax. He probably is. Talk He's is from hardly Texas, known. so one thousand <laughs> percent. It's closest neighbor. Sheesh, Mr. Krabs, the bourgeoisie, to Squidward, and SpongeBob are proletarians. With nuclear fallout, its name. Is bikini. I like that. Yeah, and Squidward and SpongeBob are kind of like the two sides of the proletariat, right? SpongeBob is up the optimist. Squidward is the uh, the defeatist. <laughs> For real. The doomer. He's just trying to do his art, though, you know, and like everyone keeps bothering him. Mood. <laughs> The way the conversation is completely derailed. I'm sorry. I keep I keep coming back to SpongeBob. I, that's my fault. SpongeBob seems like a sock dumb. SpongeBob is Bakuna Knight. Oh my god. <laughs> it's funny. Oh man. SpongeBob thinks he can improve his life. Squidward ne just needs motivation in theory. Seriously. Spongebob is a reformist. Spongebob has bad. revolutionary potential, I think. Reading bad. True. Um, Mark, it's crazy. Analysis just analysis of Miss Puff? Ooh. It's crazy, because even in that little clip that you shared, Sal, just the brief summer, like the brief introduction, I think it's crazy how people can, can claim to be a patriot. Even in, like... In jest, they're just trying to make a point for the grift. It's like, 
how can you look at how these people have had their homes levied and toxic waste permanently put into their land and openly support the country that is responsible for all of these things? <laughs> yeah. So they, they would test it here. Um, and they also tested in Nevada, you know, and New Mexico. Um, they, they tested on, on like just whoever the fuck they wanted the United States military. And we're just and like, support the military, hug the flag. It's it's even scarier when you, like in the book that I've been reading, Legacy of Ashes, when you find out that, you know, for the, for the Cold War, we didn't have anything until 1953. And until Khrushchev gave the secret speech, we literally had no intelligence on the USSR. None. Because whenever we would get close to the border, they would clap our agents. Good. <laughs> So we literally just kind of guessed what was going on. So we were escalating with pretty much a ghost, essentially. And all these people had to suffer. It's it's just depressing when you start to think about it. The specter of everything going on and all the people that got caught under it. Yeah, it's awful. My mom grew up in rural Nevada outside a military base. She had friends in a town 40 miles from the bomb test site that would take lawn chairs out to the fence line and watch the nukes. 80% of the town was dead due to cancer 20 years later. Yep. And so that's like kind of um, what they're going to talk about in here. But yeah, they, they wouldn't even tell you there's a problem or there could potentially be a problem. They're like, you got it, fam. <laughs> like what? France also did nuclear testing in Algeria during the, their independence movement and tested over 100 bombs in French Polynesia. Yeah, um, a lot of different people had nukes, and I think there was over like 2,000 nukes tested um, in that era. And so that actually led a, to a, a lot to climate change as we're experiencing now. If you look at the the footprint of when um like uh, you'll see uh, when our um environment started changing well have you seen that video um there's some youtube video where they show all of the the nuclear tests since world war ii yeah i think that's the one i have that one saved in here oh you know what let's see if we can find that one so yeah it's like a time lapse yeah <sighs> Um, yeah, I think I have it. Um, otherwise, I'll, we'll just pull it up. It bring it reminds me of Jurassic Park, one of the most famous lines from the movie, when it shouldn't be about whether or not we can do things, but should we? Right. And I think that, you know, whatever good scientists thought they could get out of the nuclear research and whatnot, I mean, it's been horrendously evil since then and it begs the question i mean there should probably be barometers on what we study and whatnot i mean but the mass extinction that is going to occur should nuclear war ever break out you get to the point where it's like there there needs to be something to withhold this to a certain degree i mean it's terrifying thinking about it Okay, you guys can see the screen. Can you both see it? Yeah, because I have my phone and the laptop, so I'm, I'm set. Okay. Hey. Jesus Christ.
God damn it, I'm muted. All over the the West Coast right here. The Zara Bombas. In, I'm pretty sure the Zara Bombas in the '60s, Tristan. Yeah, this is all. We're all. We're at 1958, and we believe the Zara Bomba is in '63. But look at this though. 187. As compared to the USSR's 83. So anything that anybody else does, the United States has to, like, triple, you know? Like, just to fucking... I don't know if that's a triple. I can't do math. Uh, but, um, yeah, they they just... They, like, in... Uh, when they did... Shit, what's it called? MK Ultra. That was a mind control device because they wanted to um, compete with the Soviet Russia, you know, USSR's um, mind control devices because they couldn't believe that people wanted communism, you know, like that was their thing. Do, am I making sense? Are you guys listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Yeah. I'm listening with bated breath. <laughs> I'm an intense. <laughs> I'm an intense listener. All right. I just always look angry. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. It's part of it's part of my appeal. <laughs> true, true. Holy shit, this is just insane the amount of stuff that they tested right here. God damn. Wait, did you see? There, there's Britain, or this one is testing over here. Why the fuck is that happening? <laughs> <laughs> did they, they let... Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Christ. Yeah, Keisha, it was. It was NATO beginning to gain power. Oh, okay. We're not beginning by establishing their agreement. Okay, so at the very end, what was it at? 2009. Jesus. One? Damn. God, I hate how it puts this stupid ass thing there. So, yeah. That's a fucking lot of nukes that was tested. <laughs> And think about it, we're 12 years down the line from this. Shit. They, they, that was like pretty fucking recent that they were still doing that. I mean, this is just reported. Oh, true, true, true. Yeah, there's probably others that are not. Well, I mean, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist here. Wait, no, I don't. I'm in the right <laughs> place for it. Um, <laughs> but, um, I mean,. With the increasing tension between us and various Southwestern Asian countries, I mean, is it really out of the realm of possibility that the increased earthquake activity in California and whatnot might be just be us testing in the Pacific and them suffering from the backlash of it? Oh my god. And just us not telling us about it? Oh fuck. Oh shit. Oh fuck. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, I'm just spitballing, but I feel like it's 
certainly plausible considering the scope of the weapons we most likely have access to at this point. Oh, and Sarah, I see that I think it's climate change, but I mean, if they're testing at sea, wouldn't that be contributing to the climate change as well? True. It's just because of the effect that the nuclear energy is having on, on the ocean at that point as well. Oh my <laughs> god, Sean. <laughs> Uh, that face climate change is testing I want to know who Pasta La Pizza is because they're officially my new favorite person (laughs) (laughs) Uh, more reactors less less nukes ugh ugh I, I'm gonna, I gotta tell you, I hate the idea of us just shoving nuclear waste um in the ground I mean, look what it's doing. It made Sal's hair blue. Uh, <laughs> uh, Duck just pointed out that on my background, there's a Soviet soldier who fell down with his drum. Do you see that? <laughs> oh, oh, my God. <laughs> Let's just page Posada bring all the dolphins. I don't care. Bro, if we nuked the moon, the tides would go out of black and the rotation on the Earth would become irregular and all that jazz. I've seen many different theories of what would happen to, um, like, the moon if we nuked it. And I just want to say, like, why the fuck are we considering nuking the moon? Like, why are we thinking about this? We shouldn't do that. Please don't. Casual. (laughs) Comrade Tuba is helping the drummer up. It's an inspirational art. (laughs) True. Have you guys ever heard of that old... There was a, um... A project, I think it was called like Project Orion or something. It was supposed to be like a uh, an interstellar spaceship that would be that would be um, like nuke operated. Oh, what? Yeah, I think that's what it was called. But the idea was like it was this ship that had like a, a big ass like plate in the back, and then it would like they would drop nukes behind the ship, and they'd blow up and like push in that plate and propel the the ship, and so they would just it would be like. Like a putt putt putt, where where each putt is a nuke, oh, and, no. and 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 theoretically you can get up to like near light speed. Oh, um, shit. they had it all planned out and everything, but then, um, with the nuclear weapons, uh, ban, they they like banned uh, space testing, so they canceled the project. <laughs> oh my god! See, I just don't. I have such mixed feelings, like on that. I don't know. The easiest way to solve our problems is to just go up there and kill God. True. <laughs> Can we just do the gravi- gravitational slingshot instead of space nukes? Cool, you're going to have to come on and explain Shh. that to the class one day. <laughs> Let's not forget the rods from God. <laughs> Bold of you to assume there is a God. God's in the White House, right? Oh my god. No. God is not in the fucking White House. God has forsaken us. Well, listen here, Jack. (laughs) What's the next video you've got, Sal? That's gonna make me want to walk into moving traffic. We're gonna go back to the, um... The Bikini Atoll. Alright, let's get it. I had to turn my AC off. I got cold. It's my right as an American to nuke whoever I want at any time. <laughs> I'm from Bikini Atoll. Right now, I don't think I'll be able to go back. I mean, it's just not clean enough for us. It's not safe. One of the country's last traditional navigators... Alson Kellum is adrift, living in exile because he's not allowed to return home to Bikini. Ahead of the atomic testing there in the 1940s, the United States told Alson Kellum's family and the 167 people of his atoll that they had a duty to the world to leave their islands. It was a moment filmed by the military's PR unit. Scene 26, take two. 
All right now, James, will you tell them that the United States government now wants to turn this great destructive force into something good for mankind, and that <coughs> this experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction. Already good, and they're willing to go, and everything is God's hand. Well, you tell them in King Judah that everything being in God's hands, it cannot be other than good. And hereby... Holy shit balls! Say so everything... It's in God's hands. So in God's good. hands? The nukes are good because God has ordained these, so you must leave your home. Doesn't God do, like, a lot of evil shit, though? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> what a treat of a video yeah yeah this video it, it's hard to watch but this is this is the history of the united states so when you fuckers try to put up the american flag and 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 use that symbol this symbol as our future like i for one have a huge problem with it i think it's disgusting what about you? Do you like the American flag being revamped as communist? No, I think it's a joke. Mm, it makes no. me want to go to the bathroom and drop a nuke in my toilet. <laughs> I mean, people talk about proletarian patriotism, but that that's not the same thing as, as flying the American flag, you know? Right. Right. I think there's a, there's a distinct difference between being proud of the American people and labor history and, you know all of our struggles and stuff. That's a completely different thing from waving the flag and fucking using the symbolism of the, of the bourgeois state, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think my favorite example of that is Vietnam. Yeah. That's in the a, positive sense. Truly, yeah. Yeah. Because it makes sense for them to be proud of everything that they had to fight through and struggle for. And I mean... I think that any country that has fought through the class struggle and been successful has the right to have a certain amount of pride attached to that. But when you have us <laughs> trying to be proud of living in the imperial core, I mean, at that point, how can, how can you call yourself a communist if <laughs> you're proud of the country that's actively doing the most harm in the world by a mass margin? It's, it's the most basic contradiction you can fundamentally have. Yeah. Oh my god, Kooks is fucking DMing Haas. That is so funny. <laughs> he won't answer you? Uh, that sucks. I'll call him a son of a you-know-what. <laughs> By the way, you hear them singing a, their Marshallese version of You Are My Sunshine. <laughs> I just love how they're using God as a crutch to, like, push this, we're going to bomb you and it's totally poggers narrative. The Islanders are a nomadic Just group. an extension and of well colonialism. And the Yanks are going to add a little variety to their lives. Alison Kellen's 93-year-old aunt was one of those who was put on a boat and taken off her island. Oh, Jesus Seven Christ. Later, the pain of forced exile is not eased. Every day she says, when are we going back? And I keep saying, oh, one day, I don't know when, but one day. But I know, I know for a fact that we're not going back. So it really, really made me sad because I don't know what to tell her. Should I lie to her? I mean, it's not her fault, but I don't want to lie to her. Hundreds of Marshallese were shifted off their islands by the United States. Some, like Lemweo Abon, after it was too late. In March 1954, her island was enveloped in the fallout from one of the Bikini Blasts. <coughs> Codenamed Castle Bravo, it was the biggest nuclear test ever carried out by the United States. A thousand times yeah. more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. Yeah, I believe that's the hydrogen bomb at that point. If memory serves. 
the earth shook. Yeah, when when we saw the bright light and and the loud sound, most of us were very afraid. We were afraid, and we just sit down and see what will happen next. A few hours later, 14-year-old Limweo noticed white powder falling from the sky. Some of the kids, they didn't know what snow is, so they named that. Oh, the snow fell down. <laughs> this is the first time we just saw this, yeah. The snow was highly radioactive fallout from the Castle Bravo bomb. It took days for the Americans to evacuate yeah, the them. Hydrogen bomb. The survivors remain nuclear refugees to this day. The meteorologists had predicted a wind condition which should have carried the fallout to the north of the group of small atolls lying to the east of Bikini. The wind failed to follow the predictions, but shifted south of that line, and the little islands of Rongelap, Rongerik, and Uterik were in the edge of the path of the fallout. The medical staff on Kwajalein have advised us that they anticipate no illness, barring, of course, diseases which may be hereafter contracted. Jack Needenthal washed up here in the Marshall Islands capital, Majuro, more than 30 years ago and never left. Now the head of the country's Red Cross, he has spent decades fighting for nuclear justice for the people of Bikini Atoll even taking their fight for compensation to Washington. As children, you don't open up your, your history books and see a word about Bikini and the nuclear testing out here, even though in my belief, the Cold War was literally fought and won on the shores of Bikini. I mean, there were 23 weapons tested up there, 20 of them were hydrogen bombs. I mean, the people of Bikini did do a lot for mankind. I mean, even now these days, yeah, you I have figured from the time leader line. talking about exploding a hydrogen bomb over the Pacific like it's nothing. The idea that they're even playing around with words and, and notions like that is so insulting and so infuriating to the people who live out here and have been through this and have suffered for since the 40s and 50s. It's, it's really awful for us to hear that. Scientists term the experiment an entire success, a success in destruction. As the smoke rises on Aniwitok, the curtain rises on the seeds of man's oblivion. The impacts of 12 years of nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands included increased rate... Wait, did he say something about the DPRK? <laughs> I missed it. Thanks for following. Hold on. I freaking missed it. Um, I can try to lower them. An entire success. A success in destruction. As the smoke rises on Aniwitok, the curtain rises on the seeds of man's oblivion. The impacts of 12 years of nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands included increased rates of thyroid and other cancers and the permanent exile of people from their home islands. as part of a deal to give the Marshall Islands independence, the US paid $150 million. Later, an independent tribunal awarded more than $2 billion to victims of the testing program. Less than $4 million was ever paid. The tribunal office in the capital, Majuro, is no longer operating, with most claims unresolved, sitting in files gathering dust. The US government policy on the nuclear weapons legacy in the Marshall Islands is to simply downgrade and dismiss health hazards as non-existent or insignificant. Giff Johnson is the publisher of the Marshall Islands Journal. The so they did this with 9-11 too. Like anything that's like bad, they're like, yeah, it's not bad. You're fine. <laughs> And, like, it ends up with, like, a fuckload of people getting cancer and dying, usually. And then they won't fucking even pay them out either. No insurance will cover them. No insurance will even admit to the linkage between these two things, you know? They're just like, oh, I don't know. We don't know what happened. You're just so sick. 
my RB, you know, like they don't even, I don't know, it's, it's. Country's only newspaper. Oh. For three decades, he's been a passionate advocate for the local people. His wife, Darlene Keiju, was a famous nuclear survivor and Marshallese leader who died of cancer, aged just 45. It really makes us wonder if Marshall Islanders will ever get justice uh, from the nuclear weapons tests that were conducted here. And justice is the right word. It's really important to understand that, that a lot of nuclear contaminated material was tossed into a crater left over from a bomb test, a coral atoll, essentially. And a coral atoll, by its nature, is porous. When the so U.S. was getting ready to clean up and leave chemicals. in the late 1970s, they picked the pit that had been left by one of the smaller atomic explosions and uh, dumped a lot of this plutonium and other radioactive waste into the pit and covered it over with an 18-inch thick dome and left. That dome lies 1,100 kilometers to the west of the capital, Majuro. Like Bikini Atoll, this place is deemed too hot in radioactive terms for human habitation. People in the United States would not tolerate something like this in their own backyard right now, or, or any time. That's why it's up there. Well, they actually did. They did tolerate it. I mean, they, they, they did have all the testing done in Nevada, you know, and New Mexico. So, like, the, the United States doesn't give a fuck who <laughs> they, you know, really go after or test on. They literally don't fucking care. It's astounding. That I would just pretend there. it never happened. When you go right. out there, it's it's very surreal. We could just rationalize I mean, it. To me, it's like this big monument to America's giant fuck up. The dome was never meant to be anything but a temporary solution to the problem of atomic waste. At almost every stage of its construction, safety was sacrificed to save money. Every time they do that. Michael like Gerard is a US climate change specialist who's visited the dome. The bottom of the dome is just what was left behind uh, by the nuclear weapons explosion. Uh, it's permeable soil. There was no effort to line it. And therefore the seawater is inside the dome. Already the sea sometimes washes over it in a, in a large storm and the United States government has acknowledged that a major type <laughs> um 10 percent human no it wouldn't because you're banned bye <laughs> ew Spoon could break it apart <laughs> and cause all of the you kick them? radiation in it to yeah. disperse yeah he, he said so would that make me the only hardcore American patriot capitalist here first of all you're not even a capitalist right you're just a capitalist simp oh shit and um gross we, we don't want that. you can see why runet's remoteness made it seem like a good place for the dome and its contaminated contents but like most of the islands of the marshals <laughs> runet is barely a meter above sea level at its highest point when this dome was built in the late 1970s there was no factoring in sea level rises caused by climate change now, every day when the tide rolls out, as it is now, radioactive isotopes from underneath the dome roll out with it. That dome is the connection between the nuclear age and the climate change age. It'll be a very devastation uh, even if it really leaks. We're not talking just the Marshall Islands. We're talking the whole Pacific Ocean. I think it's really telling that that the ocean is rising and it's and it's and it's making this nuclear waste leak out because in a lot of ways this climate change issue has also been revi revitalizing a lot of conversations about our nuclear legacy every time someone talks about climate change you can't ignore our nuclear legacy as well it's linked absolutely kathy jetnell kijna is a poet and climate change activist 
She's proud of her Marshallese heritage. It's my home, it's where I'm from, it's where my family's from, my ancestors. They've been here for thousands of years and, and there's also just nothing like it anywhere else. And uh, it's a part of who I am. <laughs> a rising leader of her nation, Kathy Jetnell Kijuna was invited to the 2014 United Nations Climate Change Summit in New York to speak about how the Marshall Islands is on the front line in the battle against rising sea levels. The Marshall Islands encompasses more than two million square kilometres of ocean. I mean, it's the United Nations. These are world leaders from all over. And it was the first time that I was able to share something that I, was, I cared about, you know, something about the islands. And what she shared was a poem about climate change, a poem to addressed to her infant daughter. You are a seven-month-old sunrise of gummy smiles. You are bald as an egg, I mean. bald as the Buddha. You are thighs that are thunder, shrieks that are lightning, so excited for bananas, hugs, and our morning walks along the lagoon. Dear Mata Felibanum, I want to tell you about that lagoon. That lazy, lounging lagoon, lounging against the sunrise. Men say that one day, that lagoon will devour you. They say it will gnaw at the shoreline, chew at the roots of your breadfruit trees, gulp down rows of sea walls, and crunch through your island's shattered bones. Dear Mata Felibinum, don't cry. Mommy promises you no one will come and devour you. No one's drowning, baby. No one's moving. Bye, Hooks, I love no you. No one's losing their homeland. No one's going to become a climate change refugee. In a place known for sober speeches and poker face diplomacy, Kathy Jetnell Kijuna's pledge to her daughter to fight climate change moved many to tears. I mean, when they all stood up, I kind of thought they were just being polite, but I just found out later that that's not, that doesn't happen all the time. It's, it's terribly sad. Some estimates put the sea level rise here in excess of 60 centimetres by the end of this century. Oh, that's fuck. enough. To Holy shit, do you see how close it is? It's like right there. Inundate three quarters of the country. Now we're on alert every time there's a high tide because the water will come over and flood. Uh, Sean says, this is why everyone needs to check in with their local indigenous communities and ask how to help. We're on the front lines of climate crisis all over the world. Flood our houses, you know, crash against homes, it'll destroy homes, it'll dry the crops, and, you know, that didn't ever happen before. You know, we're getting a lot of more extreme weathers, like droughts, too, and so it's just gotten a lot worse in the past couple years. It will kill our reef. So if it kills our reef, it kills our fish, it kills our food. And you know Marshall has a very, very limited land, so there's really nothing for us to uh, survive on. So I would, you know, I would say the very, very short time. I, I cannot give you the year, but it, we will gradually probably start moving out soon. So the clock is ticking before you have it, to relocate? It is, it is ticking. I drive my grandson to school every day, he's eight years old, and we talk about this stuff. Why do you think the climate's changing? Why do you think things are so different now? Ice. Yeah, the ice is melting. And that's causing the seas to rise, and the Marshall Islands are very low. Jack Needenthal argues that rising seas are a bigger threat to his island home and to his grandson's future than atomic bombs ever were. I'm telling him, your life is going to be really hard, a lot harder than my life was. And the place that you love is going to be slowly disappearing, and it's going to be up to people of your generation to fight back on this. And he, he gets that. Everywhere is the coast, because there's some parts of the island that are so thin that there's ocean on either side of you. We're just surrounded by ocean, and I don't think the ocean has ever looked as big to me until I came back home after living out in the States. Yeah. In recent years, late winter king tides have swept over some islands, choking crops with salt and even wrecking homes. 
The flooding could contaminate the country's shallow freshwater aquifers and sewage-filled tides threaten outbreaks of fever and dysentery. And according to the locals, it's becoming much more frequent. We would go years in between seeing uh, big, big inundation incidents. And since about 2008, uh, it's increased with regularity uh, to the point where, I mean, we'll have six, eight of these in a year. Not even the dead have been spared. Here, graves have been smashed and washed out to sea. Shit. In 2014, a state of emergency was declared when five metre swells smashed over the shoreline. The US Geological yeah, see Survey all those buildings that, that are underwater. Pacific atolls, like those oh, in the Marshall Islands, will be uninhabitable within see where the, the water line used to be. The Marshall Islands are in grave danger. There are already a lot of people who are leaving the Marshall Islands. A lot of them go to Hawaii or to mainland United States. Some of them go elsewhere. Uh, but the long-term future of the Marshall Islands is not bright. I would say that our country is sinking. Our country is the front line, so we're facing the devastating effect of climate change. And we need the world to help us. People of Bikini got relocated from their atolls because of nuclear. Today, we're about to get relocated, not from our island, but from our country. So whatever the world is, look, is doing, please look at us. For many Marshallese, the dome on Runet Island remains a potent symbol of the threat of climate change. It may be made from half metre thick concrete panels, but as we've seen elsewhere, the ocean is likely to win out over concrete every time. The radiation levels of the people of Enewetok are supposed to be monitored here, in this space-aged US-built lab on the main island. But when we visit, the machine for assessing radioactive exposure isn't working. Great. The US mm. government prohibits the export of food from Enewetok because of the concerns about contamination. Fish from here is also banned. But this atoll surrounds a calm lagoon. And so they're not helping them medically. They are like blocking trade so they can't you know, economically help themselves that way. Like, that is... I mean, do you have anything to say about that? Any, anything? Is, isn't, isn't that always how it works? I mean, the lengths we're, we're always willing to go to to deny accountability for the various amounts of human rights violations that we commit on pretty much a daily basis at this point I mean, why would we ever want a country or a group of people to ever be self-sufficient? And the lure of fresh fish is too much to resist, despite the lingering radiation. And as we're about to find out, it's not just the people of the Marshall Islands who are living with the fallout from what happened here all those years ago. This was the site of the largest nuclear cleanup in United States history. 4,000 young soldiers toiled here for years to fill in the bomb crater underneath this dome. Among the more than 80,000 cubic metres of contaminated soil and debris was plutonium, one of the most toxic substances on the planet. For many of the young soldiers who worked here, there was a high price to pay. Those young men are now in their 50s and 60s, and few in the United States know their story. Right, no quiche commie. That's what I was just, I was thinking. Like, they they can't export, like, the anything that they do because of the toxic radiation. It, it just must be so hard, you know. 
From the islands and atolls of the Marshall Islands, I've come to the deserts of Nevada, another place where the United States tested many of its atomic weapons. In fact, you could see the mushroom clouds from the Nevada test site 100 kilometres away in Las Vegas. Damn. And that's where I'm headed today, to meet one of Enoetak's atomic cleanup veterans. The suburban sprawl of Las Vegas feels like another world away from the remote emptiness of Enoetok Atoll. But the dome is something former US soldier Jim Androll can never forget, and neither can he forgive. I had never even heard of Enoetok. I never knew that there were 43 nuclear tests out there. I didn't know it was radioactive. They didn't tell us so we landed. Uh, everybody kind of pretty much flipped out uh, when they found out. Uh, because it was radioactive? Because it was radioactive. I was told I was going yes, to... Yes, I'm sure they're devastated. ...for the last six months of the service. A specialist in the Army's 84th Engineer Battalion, Jim Androll was one of thousands of US soldiers sent to help clean up Enoetok Atoll in the 1970s. Okay, so here's another thing that I want to show you all. I want to show you the test sites. <laughs> right? In the United States. Right here. Let's get it. You all see it? Yeah. Yeah. And now I want you to see indigenous land. <coughs> the, um, these are the Indian reservations. Mm -hmm. So you see they directly overlap. Holy fuck. Wow. Uh, that's oof. Yep. A thousand workers from the U.S. Armed Forces are giving the Northern Islands a facelift, striving to dig and scrape away the radioactive soil and debris. This U.S. news story shows soldiers on Enoetok wearing radiation suits. But Jim Androll says this was just a show for the TV cameras. There was no special gear issued. We were um, just issued our normal uh, warm weather gear, which would have been shorts, t-shirts, hats, and, and uh, jungle boots, and that's it. And were you given radioactive decontamination track? No, none whatsoever. Was there any safety equipment? No. If people do come back to Runet Island, they'll be risking perhaps the hottest radiation on Earth. This island won't be fit for human habitation again for at least 24,000 years. On Runet Island, site of the dome, soldiers were exposed to one of the most toxic substances known, the result of a bomb test gone wrong. One of the attempted nuclear weapons explosions didn't work. And so the plutonium, rather than having a, a nuclear blast, was just broken apart by the conventional explosions, oh, uh, leading to a um, about 400 little chunks of plutonium oh. that were spread all around the atoll. Those 400 oh. chunks were put in plastic bags and tossed into the crater underneath the dome. Oh my well, God. Well, they have us round up, walk around and pick up loose pieces. Uh, for instance, and just gather up whatever we could, throw it in a pile. And I, I never had any clue that dust could literally get into your lungs. But these guys were dealing with that every day. All of us were. We all were. Declassified US government documents revealed that Washington knew the troops would be exposed to plutonium on Runet Island. This secret cable from 1972 talks about the existence <laughs> of solid plutonium-bearing chunks on the island's surface. It warned that the quantity of plutonium was undoubtedly large and that it presented a new and serious concern. Many of the U.S. soldiers Indigenous nationalists, who worked at that's Anawitar, fire. ...have since come down <laughs> with uh, illnesses that they say were caused by their work there. Jim Androll is one of those soldiers. For years, he suffered from a myriad of complaints he says are linked to his service on Enoetok. He had his gallbladder out. Shortly after that, they found a seven and a half pound tumor, cancerous tumor in his abdomen. I suffer from roughly 40 to 45 residuals from the cancer. Right? <laughs> we really don't care about the U.S. soldiers. But, like, it's just a testament, uh, like, to show you, like, don't fight for the U.S. because the U.S. will fucking... 
they will give you cancer and they will tell you to go fuck yourself. So don't ally yourself with the United States fucking military. Okay? They are not going to protect you. Well, I mean, it's my favorite part of Muhammad Ali back during Nam when he said, I'm not going to fight for a country that doesn't even protect my rights. I think that should be the logic for most American citizens. Right. <laughs> yes. Thanks for following me, uh, my liver Rihanna. For watching kidneys. The problem for former cleanup workers like Jim Androll is that unlike the other US soldiers involved in the atomic tests, the government does not recognize them as atomic veterans. Of course. This means what? The 4, yep. cleanup vet they oh, they frick. fucking yeah, they they don't acknowledge. This is another thing. They will not even acknowledge that this is happening. Veterans have no special health care. I want to acknowledge my foot up their ass. Are lumbered with crippling medical bills. Washington argues safety precautions on Inuitok were exemplary, that workers' radiation exposure okay. fell below recommended limits, and that their oh, illnesses sucker, you know and the what? time they spent on Inuitok are not linked. I mean, these people were in the army. What choice did they have? They were told, go clean up Inuitok. They went. Uh, I think mostly they're trying to get health coverage, medical care, uh, because they've got just, uh, some of them have terrible bills. Uh, really high bill, bills from uh, from hospitals because of their treatment. There has never been a formal study of the health of Inuit. So um, Sean says also everyone here understands where toxic nuclear waste or toxic and nuclear waste gets dumped and buried, right? There's more to that testing site overlapping than just those test the uh, the test detonations. There's a shitload of nuclear weapons plants and uh, that shut down all over the country and had to dispose of the weapons and they dispose of this on you know uh the treaty land you know the land that they promised to the people who they genocided when they stole it initially so i think it's well i don't want to say i think it's crazy i just think it's i think it's gross that these people never qualified for anything from the military and whatnot and yet, when when nine eleven happened, they set up a whole different insurance fund for them, for one isolated event, as opposed to well, actually, the numerous atomic testing came up. With that, though, uh, a lot of people experienced the exact same thing with the United States and the insurance company. Um, uh, they weren't um, covering most of the cancer and um, the fallout from them the the workers breathing in the asbestos from the towers so th those people uh the first responders experienced uh, virtually the same thing talk workers but one informal survey reported that hundreds suffered problems such as cancer right black fig brittle bones and birth defects in their children Hello, Hello, mate. How's it going? I didn't think I'd be seeing you in hospital. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little bus up. Take us. Sit down, man. Are you, uh, how are you feeling? Uh, strange. They, uh, I might have had some damages done to another part of my body yeah. when they were putting in the uh, stomach aneurysm. In a wee talk veteran, Ken Cassick knows all about hospital bills. We meet in Hawaii, although by the time I arrive, Ken has been rushed to intensive care with a brain aneurysm. As a 24-year-old, he was working at a US Air Force base in Hawaii when he was asked if he was interested in running the military exchange on an idyllic Pacific atoll called Inuitok. Oh, sign me up. That's it, I'm gone. My whole vision in life was to live on a deserted tropical South Pacific island. Watch out what you tell the Lord. <laughs> it came through. Oh, so he's a colonizer this too? No yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Not long after arriving on Inuitok, Ken Cassick realized well, he was living was and working dumbass. in the middle like, of a massive nuclear cl Of course he was. He just said, okay. Oh, to the Sarah, US damn. <laughs> Sarah deserved. Uh, <laughs> clean up. Thanks, One Jesus. centered on the dome on Runet Island. It was a very dirty operation. And the same vehicles that transported this filthy, 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 horrible atomic waste to ruin it, the boys are on these boats 
you can see the crap going on their faces and on their bodies. You know, you cannot get away from it. Like Jim Androl, Ken Cassick says he was never given any safety gear or training. He says the thousands of young men sent into the cleanup had no idea of what they were exposed to. And it's a total secret. We didn't even know. The guys didn't know. None of those guys would, would be in an area that's so contaminated if they knew about it. We were lied to. And our boys work six month tours on a dirty island. And the government says you were never there. The government Cassick says, has undergone nearly four psych, you well, weren't why, there. Why was the island dirty, chief? Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to do a colonialism, but then I had to deal with being treated like the colonized. Oh, my God. Truly. There was also this gross fetish. fetish, fetish is the, why can I not say that? Fetishization. Words are hard of the South Pacific during the Cold War while we are literally bombing the shit out of them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he lives in Hawaii and he lives in Nevada right now. Oh, yeah. Hanford and a bunch of places in Colorado and Illinois, um, old manufacturing plants that had to be shut down and they were, er, and they had to do away with all of that waste. So they buried it on treaty land or dumped it in our waterways. Yeah, they just would fucking dump it in the water. They're like, it's gone now, see? Bye-bye. 40 surgeries for cancerous lesions, which he blames on his time on Inuitok. But he and Jim Androl count themselves lucky, saying many of their comrades died young and in terrible pain. Comrades. The is killing everybody. Yeah, there's been so many. Wouldn't it be sick? Uh, we just lost one two weeks ago. We lost one about six months before that. They told me I'd be dead by now. Kenny's supposed to have been dead by now. Jim Androl's wife, Bev, is now helping the Inuitok veterans battle for justice, that shirt? both in the corridors of Washington and on social media. Most of that these shirt looked like some Nazi shit. In our lives, but they're yeah, like he... our brothers. We love these guys. Oh, God. And, you know, they're dying at before they're 60. It's, it's ridiculous. There's nobody trained in the How the dare atomic he use waste. comrades? There's people trained in the, the actual making of the bombs, testing the bombs and all like that, but not picking it up. You cannot get rid of this. The island should just be destroyed. Now he wants to destroy the island. Jesus. God damn it. There's like people living Wherever on it. His He's work like, destroy around it. the world. Ken Kasich always returned here to his Hawaiian home. These All days, right. restricted to a Can we just push him into the volcano? For real. Like, bro, you already did destroy it. Like, what the fuck? Bed. He rarely gets to enjoy it. Can't just too good for this style. asshole. Ken needs to go. It's been four decades since he first <laughs> left here for his adventure on Enoch. Ken needs to walk to the gulag ex expeditiously. Both <laughs> mentally and physically. He's the probably dome. dead from cancer already, so we'll be fine. America dumped all of Shame. <laughs> to the Marshallese and abandoned them with it. And we don't want to hear about it. It's a cab, that's shame. right. And it, it, uh. You almost humanized yourself there, bud. It looks, you fucked it, it up. makes us look bad. I mean, I don't know, that Pringles mustache isn't doing him any favors. <laughs> the people of the United States, they're welcome. In their simplicity is a weak ass mustache and their courtesy two out of ten than willing to cooperate although they don't understand the world of nuclear energy any more than we do runa dome embodies injustices in many different ways you don't say the fact that all these weapons were exploded there the fact that this plutonium was left behind the fact that the workers who worked there have not been compensated. And very importantly, the fact that the entire nation is endangered by sea level rise, which is caused mostly by the greenhouse gas emissions of the major emitting countries of which the U.S. was historically number one. These are an accumulation of injustices. The last couple of years when people would come and they wanted to talk about the nuclear legacy, I said, the nuclear legacy 
is is not I'm as saying nuclear and is almost not as important as climate change because mm -hmm. if I'm a Marshall I'm they're fucking what? linked you bozo <laughs> This is like yeah, nuclear, lack of the like historical energy. materialism that like you know like once again what a lack of reading does to a motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> like he keeps trying to isolate like these fucking testing from climate change these are linked you dummy these are linked and you have to acknowledge that to move forward Islander, smartest an liberal, an island that has radiation on it and has the hope of someday being mitigated or rehabilitated. If I have a choice between that island and <laughs> right? one that's underwater forever, this documentary I'll take shit the radioactive the bed. island every time because there's still hope. I want to kick this guy Once in the nuts. Let's get discount Mark Ruffalo. Coming back. <laughs> <laughs> the Marshall Islands may be damned either way. Because Michael Gerrard says even if the dome is smashed apart in a Pacific storm, it may make little difference to the environment outside. I'm persuaded that the radiation outside the dome is as bad as the radiation inside the dome. And therefore it is a tragic irony uh, that the US government may be right that if this material were to be released, that the already bad state of the environment uh, around there wouldn't get that much worse. Oh my god. So they're like, it doesn't really matter because it's basically already out anyways. They're just still, still not taking accountability. Just release it. It's fine. It's like literally released anyways. Uh, these people are all insane. That one guy's like, oh, it was bad to do all that, so let's just destroy the island. Like, what? The most what? <laughs> How do you reach history. that conclusion? And now its survival is threatened yet again by the actions of much larger nations thousands of kilometers away. Kilometers. Oh my God, you know what? These are situations where the Marshallese people are almost are either guinea pigs or they're just seen as disposable. We're seen as disposable in both of these situations. We're disposable, our lives don't matter, the war matters, nuclear bombs matter. Our lives don't matter, oil matters, money matters, gas matters, you know, uh, profits matter. Solidarity to the Marshall Islands. Kathy Jetnil Kijina is determined that her child will not become a climate change refugee. I don't think we're doomed. And I also can't accept that, you know? If you accept that you're doomed, then what is left to fight for? You know, where are you gonna find hope? She has revolutionary optimism. A lot of people describe our islands as drowning, but we like to say that, you know, we're fighting. We're not just drowning. There are thousands out on the street, marching hand in hand, chanting for change now, and they're marching for you, baby. They're marching for us because we deserve to do more than just survive. We deserve to thrive. Damn right. Dear Mata Filipino, you are eyes right. heavy with drowsy weight. So just close those eyes and sleep in peace because we won't let you down. You'll see. Okay, I'm going to switch back to talking. You guys talk really quick. I'm going to refill my water. Tell us all, all right. what you thought of that documentary. Um, oh, we have a raid. Hold on. Uh, welcome in, comrade clever name. Uh, thank you so much for the raid. We are talking about nukes today. Okay, go. It was, it was pretty interesting. I mean, obviously... You know, it had a very somber theme because the reality is when talking about nuclear reactors and nuclear bombs and whatnot, unfortunately, we tend to not account for the collateral damage that always comes into play. And I think it's, it's very interesting and very sad to have to hear about what this has done to the people living there and the consequences that they have to deal with that they didn't sign up for, that they wanted no part of, that they had no idea what was going on, you know, and it gets to a point where it's like, 
it's like the woman said at the end where she discusses how the U.S. sees them as expendable and that all that matters is the testing and that the resources survive, commodities survive. And it's really sad that once again, we put the U.S. military above the lives of a bunch of human beings. And it goes to show you that no matter what generation it is, our inhumane treatment is always going to come first. And I mean, just to kind of tie it into what we were talking about, I mean, opposing things like that is why you shouldn't be walking around with an American flag talking about how great it is to be an American and to be proud of it, realizing that nobody creates more refugees than the U.S. And it's sad having to see that. I mean, it was so somber at the end having to listen to her almost feel like she has to daydream about a world where her child doesn't have to worry about it. That that really hit me at the end, honestly. Yeah, and then, and then like, the, the white people throughout the video, like either justifying it or uh, there was this juxtaposition between the indigenous people speaking and then these white people are like, ah, just let all the radiation out. It's too late now. Fuck it. Or just destroy the island. It's like they're talking about how horrible this whole thing was and then uh, they really haven't arrived at any kind of... Uh, like, like they, they haven't evolved in their position at all. They're like, it's bad, so just fuck them. Right. Yeah, literally. And it's annoying because that's consistently our position when it comes to dealing with the aftermath of nuclear fallout in any capacity. I mean, think about what happened with Hiroshima and Nagasaki when we started learning about all the birth defects that occurred 10 to 15 years after the fact. I mean, we had to deal with a mass leukemia outbreak from Hiroshima. And I always forget the name of it. It's it, A Thousand Paper Cranes or something. I can't remember the name of the book. But there's one book where they talked about how one child literally was chronicling dying from leukemia caused by the atomic bomb in World War II. And it goes to show you that we don't take accountability for these things. But we want to talk about how great of a success it is when the bomb drops. And when you talk about... How, oh, you know, the test was a success and that all, that's all that matters. You know, accomplish the mission. That's all that matters. And, I mean, once again, when you live in the most individualist society in the world, you you aren't dealing with, you don't, you lose your humanity in a sense. And I think that when it comes to the United States and to the United States military, our aggression, I think, has dehumanized us to the point where I think it's disgusting because... We still have people saying we need to reach out to the people that blindly support the United States because that's true solidarity. But at the end of the day, yeah, don't get me wrong. Are there shades of gray in the world? Absolutely. But when it comes to nuclear arms, when it comes to supporting the military, there is no white and there is no gray area. There's either you support these people committing these violent atrocities or you commit your life to standing against them. Chun-Li, you're absolutely right. Uh, referring to it as a, a test implies no people are impacted, that it's just empty land, when that's not been the case in any of these uh, instances, but that's what people view it as, you know? Vietnam victims and still alive uh, from spina bifida from Agent Orange, confined in wheelchairs. And, yeah, Keish, that's exactly right. When America still denies the Native American genocide. I mean, True. like, it, it's, it's ridiculous because we're never going to, the U.S. is allergic to accountability. Oh my God, yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things that it's, they think it's a well-kept secret, but it's really not. And more and more people are realizing it. I mean, you can't just wake up one day and th Think about, think about how a whole generation of people grew up under the Patriot Act and whatnot. And how, as time has gone on, pretty much every, like, something like 48% of people oppose the Patriot Act. And as you get down generational lines, it only grows. 
So we already have a new generation that's historically distrusting of the government. <laughs> and, you know, as, as they become more inoculated to the history of the U.S. in regards to nuclear weaponry, I think that's only going to grow farther and farther. Well, especially, too, since now we have this war over our history, um, whether or not the people are even going to let the teachers teach it, what happened, you know? Yeah, I mean, Sal, over down by you, I mean. Oh, yeah. There's uh, mass my restrictions. My fucked. <laughs> Do not come to Florida. <laughs> it's fucked down here. Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, like, that's the thing. You've got Florida, you've got Texas, and I mean, with all the running on state legislatures at this point that, you know, the right wing is beginning to have, it's going to get to a point where American history is just going to be flushed out in terms of the actual horrors that we've done. I mean, in Texas, they're literally censoring the I Have a Dream speech from history books. <laughs> Jesus, I, I hadn't heard about that. And I mean, I know I'm just pointing, I know I'm kind of just singling out Texas and Florida, but the state legislature problem is that's countrywide. I mean, to a varying degree in every single state, st state legislatures are more and more right wing dominated. And Sarah, to answer your point, was American history ever taught correctly, though? No, no, it definitely yeah. has never no been way. taught correctly. But the point is, is that it's going from shit to complete shit. No, they, they teach but. you that racism is over and it was over in the 1960s. And then everyone is just, you know, happy <laughs> here. Well, yeah, I think that I think that in terms of the racism. Yeah, MLK it, ended racism. That's what they say. Yeah, he just said, I have a dream and then racism was gone forever. They, for, I remember, they leave out the part that he was fucking shot and killed for, you know, that, but, you know. And and specifically when he started to reach out to poor white people. I will never, I will never understand that. I will never understand exactly how people can justify the treatment of every single African-American revolutionary as a, they were a violent threat. Because, I mean, all right, if you want to, if you want to imprison and assassinate every single violent threat in the United States, then, I mean, you should sign up to be a prison abolitionist, I'm just saying. Um, because there's no more violent threat on a day-to-day -day basis than the police departments of the United States and the U.S. military. And it's the history of aggression we have is ridiculous. And I think personally that the growth of nuclear arms is just, I think that that's the perfect example of how the U.S. tends to handle its problems. And the culture that the U.S. has established is we are rooted in aggression. And that's, that's how it's always going to be until enough people decide that enough is enough. Comrade Clever Name says, then racism was ended again when Obama was elected as president. My fellow Americans. <laughs> that, that's really American exceptionalism then. We ended racism twice. <laughs> For real. <laughs> like, oh, pff, shit. Um, that that reminds me of when, when Trump was running Back again and Pence was running around saying, make America great again, again. Again, <laughs> a, again, again, yeah. I Did you guys hear about the the weapons testing between, well, not between, but that North and South Korea were having weapons testing around the same time? Uh, didn't, uh, like, the thing only show, like, four nukes? by North Korea being used? Oh, yeah, that was 2009. I meant, like, yesterday. Oh, wait, what? Wait, say that again? I saw it on the news that um, South Korea and North Korea were each planning um, ballistic missile testing. Oh. Like, together? Hmm. Not, like, joint, but they were each doing it. Oh. I wonder what that means. 
Well, of course, living here, they're going to paint it out as aggression, and there's w imminent war rising. But, um... Well, DPRK should have nukes. Well, yeah, I mean, when you're a fucking small island country, <laughs> you, uh, you should have means to defend these? yourself. Yeah. That, that's Australia what the U.S. has a going for it. Yesterday threat to of nuclear China. strike. It's so annoying, because the only reason why this BS... Yeah, Peninsula, I'm sorry, Moro, I got annoyed. Um, no. See, my issue is that that BS union between, I believe, the US, the UK, and Australia is that... Oh, we want to keep... The only reason why that occurred... The only reason why that happened, honestly, is because... And this is just, this is just my hypothesis in regards to that whole situation, the whole Chinese sentiment, or anti-China sentiment the US is spreading is I think the U.S. is strongly admitting defeat in the sense that I think they know from a purely economic perspective, the U.S. has admitted defeat to China. I'm just going to point that out right now. When it comes down to it, I don't believe that the U.S. believes that they can compete with China purely from an economic point of view. I think that they are going to use an aggressive approach to deal with China because it's the only way they quote unquote have a chance to deal with it. And thank you, Grubbs. I agree. China's definitely winning. I think in the end, from an economic perspective, China's going to end up winning. I fully believe that. And Rihanna said, Can you guys debate infrared on patriotism? I mean that would have to be for me because I I can handle I can handle enough fucks. Um, <laughs> debate when you when you agree to debate has you have already lost the debate. <clears throat> because Haz yeah, doesn't do debates. He's just a bully. Haz is a bully. Yeah, he screams and he will like... It's just... <laughs> there is no debating Haz. China still needs us until they use all Australians' resources. Oh no, that's completely true. I think that when they eventually win in... The economic scope, I think that it's going to be because they have completed the Belt and Road Initiative eventually. Oh yeah, everyone's because no, that. no, no matter how much we try to interfere, they're still going to find a way around it. I mean, if memory serves, they've got their trade deal with Iran, they've got the trade deal with New Zealand, and it's only going to it's only going to continue to spread. And I mean, you've got the fact that they're they're also exploiting Africa at that point. And it gets to a point where eventually they, they're going to cover all their bases. At that point, I think and the anti-China sentiment comes from envy, right? I I don't I don't know what it, I think it's just xenophobia. Like I remember my grandma going through this like huge phase. She was like, "Look at the tags! Everything's from China," and I'm like because we like exported or we or we like moved all of our you know factories well, and shit over there like right like, if so. if i had to theorize during every single u.s period of mass economic failure we've established an enemy right i remember during the depression was the original red scare and then during the 40s 50s and 60s when we were beginning to rise we needed to. We wanted to find a way to industrialize as quick as possible, and at that point, it was okay. The USSR is trying to do this, and we can't let them outproduce us. And mind you, if memory serves, what I said earlier, we had no legitimate information on them until the secret speech. This was all a scare tactic to drum up red scare sentiment at that point, and then we move on farther. And in the nineties, oh wow, who who's going to who are we going to synthesize as the next U.S. enemy? Oh, the m Southwest Asia. And lo and behold, here we are in 2021. And it's China. I think that what we have to understand is when you live in a heavily individualized world like we do, the only way that we can ever try to create incentive for our people is we're good they're bad. We need to beat them. Yeah, and another thing that's um, really kind of interesting is um, the way that 
the United States government actually found out how to control our minds was just by these clever little ads, you know, and just repeating things over and over again. So in like the 1950s, they restructured family um, to be the the nuclear family. Right. And that was a thing that they had to sell to us because that's not what the norm was. But yeah, we're going to watch something uh, like this is one of the advertisements, like kind of selling you that lifestyle. We're oh, going to watch that. Yeah. Everyone get your vomit bag ready. We live a decent kind of life. We fathers have a little time to watch our kids and play with them. They just in the daytime. The people who laid out this place didn't forget that air and sun are what we need for growing, whether it's flowers or babies. Just watch us grow. The scales won't hold us soon. You can't tell where the playing ends and where the work begins. We mix them here. We learn by living. Playgrounds, schools, libraries are meant for everyone. Even the washing needn't break a woman's back. Machines can take it. And the wife needn't feel cooped up and lonely on washing day. A little gossip or a friendly hand is good for oh the complexion. Oh, my God. <laughs> the daily marketing's part of the fun. In fact, the market's just an annex to the kitchen. Another chance to chat about the children's measles or the weather. Or some new wrinkle in the diet that Grandma never knew. One thing is sure. Most of the greens brought in by truck from nearby farms each morning are fresh and crisp and haven't lost their flavor or their youth. In this new scheme of things, the school becomes the center and the focus of activities. Here boys and girls live and relive the life around them, getting the measure of our bigger world and shaping it anew. City and school and land in active partnership provide the raw materials for life and growth. Here boys and girls achieve a balanced personality ready to build and meet a many-sided world, facing the good and bad, choosing the best. Is this an acid trip? Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, so that's how Multi-layered they... personality? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's like how they would sell it to Americans, you know? Oh, my God. God, no wonder the boomer generation is so fucked up. Right? Oh my god. Yes, it did have Hitler Youth energy, for sure. Like ugh. Very strong Hitler Youth energy. I can feel myself sprouting a mustache. Ew, no, Jordan. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that was actually called um, Ideal White 1950s Family Should Live in Suburbia. That's like literally what it's called. Freaking disgusting. Many are saying this. You see the boys and girls developing multifaceted personalities. <laughs> yes, this is the way normal people talk and think. They're just, God forbid we just let kids play outside and just be fucking kids. Okay, we're going to yeah. watch something else about the nuclear family. Ooh. This is not something that has been. This is not. This has not always been this way. The opening shot of Lulu Wang's 2019 film, The Farewell, better be based on angles. Is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> a traditional Chinese painting of some mountains surrounding a lake. A phone rings and. Nai Nai, the matriarch whose impending death is about to become unseasoned folks film, going nuts. <laughs> <enters frame mode. laughs> what we're hearing is a phone conversation between Nai Nai, who lives in China, and her granddaughter Billy, who lives in New York City. We catch glimpses of both of their lives until we realize that Nai Nai is actually sitting in a hospital, a rather dreary place in stark contrast to the beautiful painting we were first introduced to. The painting, in a sense, is a lie, albeit a pretty one. The Farewell depicts many ways that families lie to each other, including several instances in this opening conversation. But the film mainly focuses on one big lie. Nai Nai has terminal cancer, 
And for some reason, the rest of the family has decided they're not going to tell her. I need to call her. You can't do that. I need to go see her. You can't do that. She doesn't know. The family thinks it's better not to tell her, so you can't say anything. I don't understand. She doesn't have a lot of time left. She should know, right? Now, to the average Western viewer, the idea of lying to someone about their illness is appalling. But in countries like China, this is actually quite normal. Why? At the heart of this lie lies a big difference between the Eastern and the Western idea. Okay, like, I can't even, like, I don't know if this is fucking... <laughs> Does anyone know if this is true? <laughs> I don't Jesus. know what's happening here. <laughs> she lied, he believed. Oh my god. The fucking Baber meme. He was a boy and she was a girl. Okay. Is about family. I know this feels so it just feels like I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna watch this and we're all gonna figure out what the, this is talking about. For most of human history, our families have been large, interconnected, and multi-generational. We're talking grandmas, aunts, cousins, a lot of people pitching in. In the Gambia, the average household is 14 people. And in Mexico, many people live in kinship groups of up to 70 people. But in America, we have a very different idea about what family should look like the nuclear family. Oh my god, they put up inside out? <laughs> That's what a family is, right? A married couple with two and a half kids, a two-generational enclave that's expected to function like a self-sustaining unit, a brick that makes up the wall of civilization. In the farewell, Billy's family immigrated to America when she was about six years old, leaving behind a large extended clan in China so the nuclear family model is mostly all she knows. Sociologist Ernest Watson Burgess was very interested in how exactly the nuclear family model became the default living oh, of arrangement. Of course, he's a sociologist. And it turns out it's fairly recent. Somewhere around 1910, with the rise of the industrial age, opportunity and property became more tied to the factory. More so than 1910? I don't think so, because Engels was writing about the nuclear family in like 1880. So, family suddenly prospered by being You're scaring them, frog. Flexible <laughs> and mobile. And while this way of doing life certainly Muro, has exactly. warmth and advantages, the independence of the nuclear family model comes at a cost. Fifty-four percent of Americans say that they're lonely on a daily basis. Well, capitalism the does average too, American motherfucker. only has two close friends. And while in Asia, yeah, be South America, and work. Africa, over All half the of seniors live with their extended families, in the U.S., only seven percent do. In fact, one in three seniors here lives entirely alone. This sense of isolation causes Billy to think about the whole family that she's left behind. A family that If their analysis of the family isn't chance. based on the origin of the family, I don't want to hear it. I agree, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have like a lot of um, Marxist filmmakers, so it's probably a lit. Oh. We're going to have to do a whole presentation on that book. Huh? Hey, maybe Sarah can come the on for that decides one. decides to throw a quick wedding in China to give everyone a chance to say goodbye to Nai Nai without her realizing that she's dying. Now, the Chinese family isn't perfect <laughs> by any stretch, but it's safe to say that loneliness isn't much of an issue for Billy here. This is reflected in an interesting cinematography choice and the use of the close-up shot. No, no. The close-up shot. 
the close-up shot. Okay, it's kind of amazing that this film rarely uses the close-up shot of an individual actor. Even awkward private conversations happen against the backdrop of family. You went to school. You know, one of the few good memories of my childhood were those summers at Nine Nine. As one of Billy's uncles explains, you think life belongs to oneself, but that's the difference between the East and the West. In the East, a person's life is a part of a whole family. This may be why in American films, family dynamics are usually communicated by a series of individual, self-contained reaction shots. Fredo, you're my older brother. And I love you. That's like super fucking interesting to think about, actually. Like that they're so individually minded that they don't even do conversation shots. Like you know, like uh, uh, the framing. I just think that's wild. But don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. The farewell doesn't land on whether don't take the side of anyone against the family. Am I watching a mob movie? Better, but it does try to tell the story of someone yeah, isn't that the who's a cop between exactly. two worlds. Exactly. <laughs> I need to go. Everyone thinks better if you don't. Look at you. You can't hide your emotions. If you go, Nana will find out right away. Other than size, perhaps the most significant portrayal of cultural difference is the ongoing conversation about emotional expression and suppression. What gets said, what gets covered up. She's dying. Can you be a little more sensitive? What do you want from me? To scream and cry like you? I think Billy's surprised to see that a large family doesn't necessarily lead to being seen and known. Oftentimes, in the extended family model, oh my God. the secrets... Is this pro-nuclear family? <laughs> Is that what... What's, what, are they, what are they trying to say with this? What do you think? I, I don't even know. I don't know either. I don't know what the hell's going on Artists in this video, to be different. honest with you. Billy's uncle explains it feels like the an reason acid they lie to Nine <laughs> is to carry the emotional burden for her. Uh. Master Blastoise, that's a fantastic <laughs> name in the chat. Oh my god. <laughs> Every documentary you've shown is so confused. <laughs> right, because it's made by people who don't have the correct analysis. They're not analyzing these events like properly, I feel like. I don't know. <laughs> And what a burden they've created by not only lying about the cancer, yeah, I don't know what the point but is also yet. about the wedding. They've it's, created it, a reality. It seems like if this is kind of like anti Chinese, it does know, seem like that. A burden that might be too big to bear. Choose to do it. Uh, uh, the parts about the nuclear family, While though, the English were title of the film is The Farewell, the Chinese title might better capture this burden, translating to Don't Tell Her. Uh, but uh, Chinese families aren't Right, the only it's, it's xenophobic and against the nuclear family, but also kind of pro-nuclear family, because, like, that's what I'm getting from this. So... Basically, this video stands for nothing except uh, China bad. Right. Definitely a liberal filmmaker. Oh, true. It's so true. Like They don't actually make any points. It's like, oh, this is bad, but this other thing is also bad. Therefore, we stand for nothing. <laughs> Lie to each oh, other. Oh, fuck. Billy Centrist also video. lies to her parents. <laughs> How are you doing with money? I'm fine. Can you afford this trip? Yes, I'm fine. So what's going on with the fellowship? Nothing. Well, you still haven't heard anything? No. Billy lies to maintain her independence, to prevent someone else from having to carry her emotional burden. So in China, the group might lie to protect the individual, but in America, it's often the individual that lies to protect 
the group. Get the fuck out of here! Fuck off! Oh my fucking god! Where did they get that from? Whoa! There's the fucking point. Holy fucking shit balls! Holy Uh, shit! Wow. Wow. How did they arrive at that conclusion? Fucking oh my god! In America, we care about each other. They only care about themselves. What? What? I'm thoroughly enraged. I'm gonna shit myself. You got. Who would have thought that a video titled "The Myth of the Nuclear Family" would just be like an anti-China propaganda film <laughs> between two cultures? What the Man. fuck? She has to decide what value she would like to take from each, moving forward. The collective. Re- versus replay the that. Replay that. So I want to hear that one more time. Okay. Wait. Why did Posadabot ban Cam Davis? Ba- external ban list. Oh, you've reached your bans. Posadabot just clapped you. Sorry. She has to decide I'll what value let you say she would like bad. to take from each moving forward. Yeah, go, go back. I want to hear that one more time about the, the individual and the collective. Okay. I'm sure I heard that right, because that was... So in China, the group might lie that... to protect the individual, okay. but in America, it's often the individual that lies to protect the group. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's such a bizarre generalization, too. Holy like, fuck. what are they trying to say? Nobody knows what it means, but it's provocative. <laughs> oh, fuck. It gets the people going. Billy's there for I mean, a crossroads. Is it implying that in every instance there's a fall guy? Like. <laughs> In China, the whole community will lie to you. In America, you just have to worry about one person lying to you. Or something. Miro, and, exactly. The individual lies to protect the individual. Exactly. They totally so, individualism you. good, collectivism bad. Right. Yeah. A tale as old as time. Ten minutes to say the entire country lies in the exact same way, and it's supposed uh, and that's opposite to America. Yeah, it's yeah. This is this is propaganda. Yes, it is. And she has to decide what value she. But would... this person may not even know they're making propaganda. You know, this this person maybe thinks they reached a fucking conclusion, and that's how sick liberals are. Liberals are sick. Like to take from each, moving forward. The collective Just, versus and it's a fucking movie. The chorus versus. Right? It's like this person watched a movie and decided they were going to do an analysis on Chinese society based on a fucking movie. Hey guys, this is Chris. Hey Chris, you suck. Fuck you, Chris. You're pretty <laughs> shit at your job, Chris. <laughs> oh, is that the guy who made the video? Asshole. Of Fuck course it is. <laughs> Man, he's got to come in at the end and be like, hey, guy, I'm the one who made the video. <laughs> this man is guilty of being white. <laughs> oh, my God. Holy shit. That was just the worst thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Yo, Posada bot banned that guy again. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Posada about really doesn't like you. Also, you have a bad opinion, so yeah, I get it. Thanks, Posada. It says, I don't think that the video is necessarily taking sides or saying one is worse than the other. If anything, I thought that the monologue by one of the family members talking about the burden of for them was an important inclusion for in understanding the logic behind it. No, it's definitely not great. No. I don't know why it keeps banning you, though. Yeah. I love I love how the guy that directed it looks very similar to the guy from the meme when the worst person has a good point. <laughs> Although he's not having a good point at this particular <laughs> juncture. Okay. So another thing we're going to watch is... Ugh. That was so gross. <laughs> I feel like I need a, like, a shower or something. Ew. Um, okay. There is 
uh, U.S. veteran atomic guinea pigs, which is just like soldiers describing like how bad it was for them, which eh, like, do I feel bad for you? Mm, I don't know. Wait. Anya says, are you mad China will win? I mean. Will win what? Well, How do you win? <laughs> I mean, I think China's going to win the economic the economic war long term. I don't know. Biden made a statement. He said that we're going to win the 21st century against China. So, What do you mean win the 21st century? <laughs> what do you mean win? It doesn't mean, any, doesn't mean anything. What it's just empty rhetoric. Win? I, I, mean, I don't. I don't know if I can. We just like not die. That would be cool. I feel like I mean, China's already won a long time ago because all they would have to do is stop trading with us, and we couldn't do shit for ourselves. <laughs> I think the tide turned when, like three or four years ago, Xi had a higher worldwide approval than Trump, which is the first time that a sitting Chinese leader had a higher approval rating than a U.S. president in a while. Nice. White people always want to win. Uh, yeah, I we don't like. I don't want to win. I mean, I want communism to win, but <sighs> some soldiers are okay. Um, there's still the the jury's still out on that, whether or not we. Western oh, yeah. propaganda about winning is like that dog with the frisbee meme. Win, no live, only win. The accuracy. <laughs> so true. Okay, so now we're going to watch um, deadly nuclear tests on U.S. troops and civilians spans decades from the oh. Empire Files. So this is going to be a more accurate analysis uh, if there is an analysis, like the Empire Files is is kind of decent, so I don't know. If, do you guys know about the Empire Files? No, but I'm ready to find out. Um, did they make that movie on Palestine a couple of years ago? Mm, I don't know. I'll have to check. Having already dropped two atomic bombs on the civilian cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, the U.S. Yeah, government had ample them. time to study that the Gaza fights for of freedom radiation. movie. Yet over the next three decades, the newly dominant U.S. empire decided to sacrifice hundreds of thousands of its own soldiers to test the limits of its most powerful weapon. After World War II, the U.S. state claimed the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean, home to 68,000 people at the time. In 1946, yeah, the U.S. Abby carried Martin. out Operation Crossroads at Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The first of By the way, that's a nuclear great movie to the guys out Using unwitting human subjects. The Baker Test Blast was the detonation of a 21 kiloton nuclear bomb 90 feet underwater causing enormous damage and widespread radioactive contamination. Navy ships full of sailors were specifically placed in the fallout radius. According to a lawsuit, every single they person did that shit on purpose. one vessel died at a young age from radiogenic disease. Eight years later, never gonna the get used military to seeing conducted these videos. Castle Bravo, exploding a hydrogen bomb a whopping 1,000 times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Japan on Bikini Atoll. Exposing thousands more services. There were people like right by the blast site too in a bunker. To radioactive oh, yeah. reading. According to a twenty twelve Yeah, that's who the soldiers were and they describe like seeing like through their body. Yeah. Like that the radiation lit them up so that they were like clear. Jesus. UN report. The 67 tests covered the Marshall Islands with a radioactive plume that caused near irreversible environmental contamination and loss of culture and livelihoods for native people who faced indefinite displacement after being forced to evacuate. According to residents, some of the country's islands were completely vaporized during the tests. Tens of thousands died from radiation-related illness, according to the Institute of Medicine, with thousands more civilian victims abandoned. At the same time across the world, 
More than 200,000 American soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines were forced to partake in a series of open-air nuclear blasts in the Nevada desert, named Operation Desert Rock. The unwitting soldiers that participated were callously called ground grunts, ordered to sit in ditches dangerously close to the explosions with no protective gear. They wore badges to monitor their exposure levels so the government could test what grotesque results arose from their new weapons. In 1957, the U.S. government carried out the most controversial and deadly of all the Desert Rock tests, Operation Plumbob, a concentrated series of 29 nuclear blasts involving 16,000 soldiers. To illustrate just how the military commanders viewed their soldiers, they also tested hundreds of pigs in the same experiment. One would think oh. if the results of such a potentially deadly test were so uncertain, they'd tested on the pigs before young soldiers. During this nuclear dystopia, radioactive fallout poisoned not only soldiers, but countless civilians and communities from Utah to Arizona. All the while, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission assured the population, there is no danger. It wasn't until 1980 that a Congressional Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations concluded all evidence suggesting that radiation was having harmful effects, be it on the sheep or the people, was not only disregarded, but actually suppressed. Joel Healy was a soldier in the army when he witnessed Plumbob. He realizes now that his own government did this to him on purpose, saying, Because I'm thinking, they spent a lot of money training me to be a soldier. They wouldn't intentionally put me in harm's way. <laughs> and this is 1957. We dropped those bombs in Japan Smartest in 1945. US <sighs> so they've known for 12 years. Troops going into battle know that there's a very inherent risk that they may not be coming out right. unless it's in a black bag. In this instance, they never said a word, and they knew it. Just a disgrace. The government would really never like lie to me or do bad things to me. A lot of good men died. They love me. For decades, the government denied a relationship between veterans' cancer and radiation exposure. Finally, in 1979, the first veteran was awarded disability for his radiation-linked cancer, setting the precedent for thousands of atomic veterans to receive benefits. It wasn't until 1990, though, that veterans started to be compensated, after decades of stalling while veterans either gave up or died. Those who can prove they were test subjects are still denied care. According to the American Legion, thousands of atomic veterans have been rejected because they have the wrong type of cancer. Blocked from suing the government, families and victims resorted to suing the corporations who played a role. But Congress moved quickly to protect their cohorts, passing a law in 1984 immunizing their business partners from any liability, giving veterans no Jesus. other avenue for retribution. So this is, this is common, right? This is how the United States operates. They fucking wait until everyone who was involved is dead. And then they start to act or like a little bit reasonable. I think the, liabil the liability shield is crazy. <laughs> like... Yeah, they did the same thing in 9-11, yeah. They do this all over. Any any time there's culpability that is going to implicate the United States in any wrongdoing, they're just like, nah. Nah. We didn't do that. They just look at the after effects and they just point and just say, man, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's insane. And people, and people are willing to be proud of this yeah oh sorry you have lung cancer we only cover brain cancer oh, sorry <laughs> but like for real they only cover specific types of cancer so if you don't have that one then they're like oh sorry that's not related this is your own type of cancer <laughs> they're gonna do the same thing with covid absolutely oh yeah 
one hundred thousand percent. They already the tried shit. to block the the businesses from getting getting in trouble for having workers, right? Like work during COVID. Yeah. Yeah, they can only cover certain types of cancer. Uh, that they only um, will will you know give you the insurance. Or uh, your insurance will only cover certain types of cancer. Yeah. What I don't understand is these idiots really needed a freaking scientific study thirty years after the fact to realize nuclear was dangerous. <laughs> You are se you are literally creating a nuclear fissure, and you don't think that's going to be harmful to your ass? <laughs> you serious? That you that's what blew me away. Yeah, the U.S. <laughs> health insurance is absolute trashed here. Truly, that's an insult to trash. <laughs> Do we want to hear um, the? Uh, from the people who uh, got blasted, like right, really close, hearing them describe what they felt, or Go do for we want to? Okay. This is about soldiers, so can't be too sad. But shame. Yeah, they knew they were just unwholesomely curious about how dangerous. <laughs> Just in case it was useful. Oh, he looks pissed. He looks like he's holding in a massive dump. This guy, too. This guy looks like he's in the process of doing it. Yes, I'm a little perplexed right now. Is that just part of being old, though? Starting to think Like, this constant things. look like you're going to take a dump? <laughs> I'd be curmudgeon, too, if it's not coming out. <laughs> you know, my wife's the only person I ever told. I never told anybody, not my parents, not my brother, not my best friends, not my wife. Are you a soldier, Blot? Are you are you a veteran? Nobody. Or are you old? <laughs> Which one are you feeling attacked for? Probably old. <laughs> old. <laughs> I go in tears talking about it now. It, old. It's affected me. I'd like to think it hasn't affected me. I like to think I'm. I can tough it out and everything's okay. It has affected me. I will admit to it. Um, you just saw a little bit of it now. Um, I can't watch the bomb. These men are terrified. Hood was the biggest. Uh... Like they, they look terrified, don't they? They look, they still look scared. I mean, it reminds me of the of the Oppenheimer like the interview, where he literally, after it gets dropped, it's like a week or two after, he literally looks like his eyes are just gone, like he has completely given up hope. And that's kind of the vibe I'm getting with this so far. Um, uh, I can't imagine no, actually no, seeing, no, not... seeing the blast that close. I don't think seeing it on video is going to compare in any way. Oh, no, certainly not. To see the, the sheer destructive power of it. Yep. It's tits. <clears throat> The morning of July 5th, 1957, about four in the morning, they put us in a trench. Uh, I think it was a mile from ground zero or less. I was in a platoon with 40 other people and uh, we had a, for protection, we just had our utility jackets, our weapons, um, helmets and a gas mask. The attitude in the trenches was these people were concerned but they didn't know what was going to happen they had no idea and uh they was you know these were some these were well-trained trained men so it would not have 
I don't think they would have been afraid to go into combat, shoot people without any problem. But they didn't know what this bomb was. We followed the instructions, which... He, okay, so unpack what he just said. These are trained soldiers. They would have had no problem going and shooting people. That's what he just said. <laughs> so, like, do I... I'm not really too sad for you. I don't know. ...were to crouch down, uh, put our backs towards the uh, the shot, and uh, bow our heads and cover our, our eyes. And we got to the point that everybody's basically in the trenches. There's about, they started the countdown. <laughs> 59, 58, 57. I got my gas mask on. I had trouble cinching it down. And it got down to nine. I grabbed my helmet, put it up to my head about like that. And the bomb went off. It really was the most, I'll never experience anything like it again. I know that. It was completely daylight at midnight. Brighter than the brightest day you ever saw. I cannot begin to describe the light that came into my eye. I was totally blinded. When I came out of the blindness, I saw my hands. By this time, I actually saw the blood vessels and, and my bones in my arm. You could literally just see every bone in there, everything. Even the guy's bones and back that was in front of you. That's how bright the light was. To go from through the back of your head through your eyes and into your fingers, you're seeing your bones in your hands. Oh, he's from around me. How did, that, how did it come through all that to get to your bones that you could visually see them like an X-ray? The light faded and it's like streaks of lightning from ground, from the ground to the sky about every two feet around you. And then that faded and it was like giant bar balls in front of your eyes. When the wave hit me uh, in a, it it knocked me over uh, i actually flipped over all of us fell down on the ground the blast caught me in the face broke my glasses knocked me on my butt put a whole bunch of shrapnel in my face it's mostly like uh, little glass beads that were melted glass beads in my neck and had a hole in my neck and one in my lip and and it felt just like you would take a red hot iron, like your iron with an iron on an ironing board, and put it to your neck. People screaming uh, and and running. And there was panic. There was panic and people screaming because of the heat. Everybody started yelling and, and some people calling out for their mothers and uh, some of the trenches collapsed. I don't know. It's like I had lost it. And uh, I don't know why, because um, I'm losing it right now. The whole clump of ground, 10 yards this way, 15 yards this way, 10 yards back over here. So another thing I want to like say, too, is the psychological damage is um, on purpose, right? The United States tries to psychologically damage its enemies so the fact that this is happening is like they are happy about that you know terror is what they're looking for yeah, you guys that's why they nuked the Japan yeah because you know they didn't have to it, everyone knows they didn't have to do that you know no it was meant to be a massive flex yeah So that's how fucking evil this fucking place is. Just in case it was a useful factor. Yeah, the, yep, you're right, Asphira. Trouble they were throwing up. It was a normal thing, I guess. We had to dig two guys out. And we're standing there watching the mushroom cloud farm. And you could see it with the naked eyes that sucked all the sand up. <clears throat> There was, people were gathering then, kind of coming back and looking at this spectacular, 
spectacular shot. It was, it, it actually, you're gonna die when I, when I tell you this, it was, it was so big. It, Am it, I? It looked, it, the colors were beautiful in a sense, I hate to say that. You see this molten cloud changing color as, as it, it kind of turns within itself. Beautiful purples and lavenders and popping and blipping and just doing. And it was boiling and just orange and reds and black and gray and whatever. And it just kept boiling. Colors they can't like describe the reminds me of that Lovecraft story. Outwards. It's color out of space. It's I've never heard of it. seems like it keeps on going and it keeps expanding and then it reaches a point where it kind of colors up at the top as it closed in it was uh, a huge red ring all the way around as far as you could see from the horizon on or from the horizon and as it closed up like an aperture on a camera on one side of the red ring was daylight on the other side was night I saw planes going through it, which, you know, even at its growth stage, there were we were flying aircraft through it. Uh, they took roll yeah. call, and there were two Jesus. people that were missing, but we went on without them. Never found out again what what happened to those two. Um, there were a number of trucks that were turned over on their sides, and things like tires and whatever were smoldering from the fire. And I seen all the steel from bulldozers, cranes, cars, trucks, everything yes. completely destroyed. And when you see a bulldozer blade rip like paper. He's from around me, off. clearly. The coat <laughs> retriever was the main thing. That huge chunk of metal ended up to be a, a puddle the size of a chair. Guys. In the course of this, there was a <laughs> one-star general, Marine general, who was who was bewildered, and uh, I guess he had kind of lost temporary loss of school, and he says, "I don't know where I am. I've lost my men. I've lost my men." And and I says, "I says, calm down, general. I says, look, I says, I've I've been in a few of these shots now. It's okay. We just gotta wait till the dust settles a little bit." And uh, <clears throat> he was all upset. I, I, I don't know. I think I calmed him down, but he was uh, pretty upset. And I seen some guys coming towards us, like to the right of us, towards the bomb, even like they were walking towards us as we were walking to the left of the blast. And I thought. What are they wearing? They have some kind of different clothes on because things were dangling like they had padded clothes or something. It, it looked odd. This is a, a warning. Anyone who's like squeamish, uh, this is a cont content trigger warning. Uh, I know that it's a bit late, but uh, yeah. Um, anybody who is squeamish, maybe mute or come back in a few minutes. And uh, through some other people and, and talking over the years, I, I think it was their flesh. Nobody had uniforms that dangled like that. Uh, you know, I, th I think a lot of us knew that this was not a good thing for us. The only thing that they did for us was for us to secrecy. We, we couldn't talk about it. We couldn't talk about it to anybody for $10,000 fine or 10 years in prison. Everyone was told a fucking that you were gag never, order ever to discuss this again. Man. That what you saw stays with you forever. 
you can't tell your wife, you can't tell your kids, and particularly you can't talk amongst yourself. So you can't turn to your buddy and say, gee, what'd you think of that shot? Or have any discussion regarding the atomic bomb. That's where the paranoia was. They put the fear of God in you. You know, the, you know, when you start talking about treason, they, they can be executed. That's a, that's enough to, I mean, go to jail is one yep. thing, but treason. It haunts me to think of what I had witnessed and not realized at the time the import of what we were doing at the time, actually serving as guinea pigs. We were just, it was like an experiment animal to use in a lab. When I got out of the military, I had after effects, like I was losing my hair. I had uh, spine problems and this and that. I have spent a number of years when I was out of the service, waking up in the middle of the night, seeing the atomic bomb. I didn't sleep for a long time, very well. And all I was always had this bright light that would flash on. Hello, time to get up. No, no, it isn't. It's got no light bulb out there, turkey. You're just dreaming you had, you know. I had developed a- That guy's uh, not doing great. A tumor. Clearly. In 04, when I went down and registered as an atomic vet. And Turkey. it uh, turned out that the tumor was called swanoma tumor. It was caused by ionized radiation. And uh, for 10 years now, I've been trying to get uh, compensation for that. But the, the government does not want to admit to anybody that was that was harmed by any radiation. They've been they've been putting me off for over ten years now. He looks a little like well, Danny Cavito. Everything that was going to happen and what danger was involved in it, they're just hoping you all die before they have to do anything. I don't know that anybody will ever know, uh, because I suspect that nobody will give a damn. Uh, when I'm gone. If it was done for science and and the availability to, to the rest of the human race to know that uh, that we don't need it, it's way too devastating. If you could just see the colors, if you could just hear it, hear it, not on the television or in the movie, but the actual thing, I, I think you would agree with me. These men are fucking terrified. <laughs> They're like trembling and like Jesus Christ. Whoever Can you point to where the nuke is in the room? <laughs> I mean, it's just pointing out like the severe psychological damage that was done by this type of weapon. I don't know. I'm just what do you think? I mean, this is this is the way that they're able to keep the, so many things a secret. I mean, you see how scared these fucking guys are. <sighs> yeah, not I even mean, allowed to speak amongst each other. Like, they can't talk about it at all. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah, uh, definitely don't go into the military and if you're in the military um just steal some of the stuff and then leave you should leave in minecraft wait no leave in <laughs> life but like steal the stuff in minecraft in real life <laughs> don't witness an atomic bomb you many are saying <laughs> Yeah, if you're in the military, get the fuck out of the military. <sighs> okay. So, yeah, I think we will do 
one more and then we can be done for today now that we've thoroughly yeah. depressed everyone yeah <laughs> Mm-hmm. Did we do this one? Okay, so this one is about the Nevada testing site. Ooh. Yes, thank you, uh, Chun Li, for being here. Uh, this is all good stuff to know, like when you're trying to talk to people who want to wear the fucking flag, you know? Do you want to be a patriotic proletarian? Yeah, I mean, it's just not that possible with the United States. This music is so catchy. In Las Vegas, it's just another bright and gaudy night. But the skies are clear, the wind is down, and tomorrow, only 80 miles away, is D-Day. Traveling 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas on US Highway 95, we arrive at the Nevada test site. Established in 1951, the Nevada test site stands above all other nuclear sites as the most bombed location on Earth. The test site was picked in 1951 out of three other sites here. Reason that the scientists came here is that they were looking for a place to do on-continent nuclear weapons tests. Uh, at the time, they were doing all the nuclear weapons tests on the Pacific. It was very expensive. President Truman wanted to see if they could find a location in the United States to do the smaller, lower-yield nuclear tests on continent. And they ended up with the Nevada test site. At the time, it was called the Nevada Proving Grounds. Huh. When we bring people through Mercury, which is the base camp of operations for all the activities out here at the Nevada test site, they come through a small pass. The first thing that visitors see when they come to the test site is the Frenchman Dry Lake Bed. Yeah, it is William Shatner. We come to thee, Nevada test site. Damn, they got Captain Kirk for this. <laughs> so they made the soldiers sit right there. That's where the first atmospheric tests were conducted out here on the test site. The first test was conducted on January 27, 1951. Fourteen total tests were conducted out there on Frenchman Flat. And what people see when they go out to Frenchman Flat is the historic structures that remain from those atmospheric days. There's the hotel, motel walls. What the scientists were doing with those is they built the faces of those out of different types of materials, brick, mortar, concrete block. And they wanted to see what the pressures from the blast would do to those walls, what would stand up, what wouldn't stand up. You also see an old railroad bridge that is sitting out there. It's pretty remarkable because it's, it's one of the things that really gives you a good idea what the heat and blast effects. You've got these very thick I-beams that have been bent, almost like spaghetti. Shit. There's some concrete domes. What we know about the principles of hardening of concrete were developed out there on Frenchman Flat at the test site. The scientists used different types of mixtures of concrete, of mortar, mixed with rebar, different sizes of rebar, so they could understand how to harden concrete. One of the more unusual things that's also out there on Frenchman Flat is the uh, old bank vault. The standards that U.S. bank vaults are built today are built based on the tests that they did out there at the site. And you can see where the sides have been peeled away 
from the blast, but the contents that were inside that vault at the time of the blast survived all of that. So what they were looking at is, is construction of items, how they would withstand the heat and blast. They weren't looking at the, the effects of the radiation, but how things would hold up to the heat and blast. And so a lot of modern day standards that we have for structures that we have now, bank vaults for a multitude of things have come about as a result of the atmospheric testing that took place there on Frenchman Flat during the atmospheric testing Oh, days. well, congratulations. I'm so happy for your fucking money. Yeah. Be safe, you bastards. What up, Caboose? Caboose is here? Yeah, Caboose is here. Mad lad. <laughs> Caboose has been going off lately. <laughs> I know, big fan. <laughs> <laughs> Just learning about the, the nukes that we tested on, um, you know, the people of Bikini Atoll and then our own soldiers and citizens. Just nuking stuff for fun, and then lying about it. Like a proper patriotic proletarian. Right. <laughs> Frog, I'm really jealous of your hat. <laughs> no vibes, just nukes. No, no, just nuking with the boys. <laughs> As Catholic patriots, we are also to be the last <laughs> underground nuclear test that was going to be conducted here on the test site before the moratorium was signed in 1992. But events of the world caught up with us here, and that test was never conducted. As a result, the divider test in September of 1992... Uh, nukes are actually communism because this is a Posada stream. So what you have at ice camp <laughs> is the tower... And inside that tower is the canister that would have held the nuclear device. Uh, an 1,800-foot hole is there. All the cables are on the ground. And some of the support trailers are still sitting there. Those support trailers is where all the information would have come up the cables and would have been recorded. And as well as a part of redundancy, those signals would have been sent here to the control point and recorded in the control point. This is the control point at the Nevada test site. The control point is where everything happens on the day of an experiment. Control All the point. scientists, control the point. technician, the security. Wow, no way. The control point is where they control different points. No way. Point. Whoa, this is where big, all the information comes in to Curious. tell the scientist if their experiment has been successful. In essence, it becomes the uh, nerve center for the test site on the day of an experiment. Is this from Men in Black? The Dan Crater was done in 1962, July of 1962. It was part of the plowshare program. What they were trying to see is if you could take uh, a very large device, in this case it was 104 kilotons, and use it to dig a canal, a lake. Uh, if oh you could my blast God. To make a, I fucking hate this. They're just nuking stuff to create stuff now. They're just using nukes in the ground for like... Are you hearing this? <laughs> yeah, they're using it for decoration, apparently. Well, casual. A casual, pass for casual usage of nukes. 
or a highway system. They wanted to see if you could use a nuclear device to dig with. The answer to the question is yes, but this nation never did it because of the residual radiation that's left behind. But what you've got with Sedan Crater is a big hole in the ground that's 1,800 feet across and about 300 feet deep, and it shows you the force that you can have from a 104 kiloton nuclear device. We are so fucking stupid, seriously. <laughs> just to dig, just to fucking dig. Oh my God, completely use this place of land for like thousands of years now. <laughs> oh my God, this music. What's with the music? Sarah, not the yeehaw music. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> hmm. Right, Mark? Um, I highly doubt they were using nukes. The today. Apple II they houses, just, uh, that, that was, that was, was a test that was done in 1955. It was a civil defense effects test. The civil defense agency of oh, the time video, so. in the United States wanted to see how, Five more minutes. how modern Americana right. would withhold or withstand uh, a nuclear attack on the United States. If you remember, uh, a lot of people may have read the history and seen, and, and for those that were alive during the time, the mentality was was duck and cover, or red under every bed. And so it was on the top of everybody's mind about safety from, from nuclear weapons. So what the Civil Defense Agency of the time did was create um, American homes, wood structures, brick structures, two-story homes with basements. And they outfitted these homes Just how with Stalin everything that you would person. find in a modern 1955 <laughs> home. Sorry. Uh, they put the liminal messages. Inside, they put food, they put cars, they put radios that were working. Everything in the house was fully operational that you would find of the time. Thanks for coming, Mark's uh, Hohenheim. And after the test, they came in to see Hi, what the effects were Enjoy your that Jay. American home. <laughs> so that gave the scientist an idea of the effect that was going to happen. The closer you were to the ground zero from the blast, you could see certain type of damage, and then the farther out, you would see what the damage effects would be. So this allowed them to do the type of modeling that they did back in 1955, so that they, as a civil defense agency, could prepare some type of plans that uh, the American citizens could use. This isn't what? for American citizens. Like, the framing is all off. They're just trying to see the damage that they can do. They're not trying to protect anyone. They didn't fucking build houses differently. Yeah, are they trying to... Are they suggesting that they were trying to find, like, methods of building homes that would resist nuclear explosions? It sounds like it. Yeah, it sounds like it. But that's that's not what happened at all. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Not a single documentary tonight had, had has had a good analysis. <laughs> That's the point, Sarah. <laughs> That's why we're here, because there are no Marxist documentaries, you know? And so we have to we have to be here to be like, hey, that's stupid. <laughs> Sarah, I will not be silenced. <laughs> <laughs> they're trying to defend the country from the USSR who are trying to defend themselves from the country that bombed Japan
They suspended devices from balloons. They put them on top of wooden towers. They put them on top of steel towers. They shot one out of a cannon. That was through the 1950s. Look then at with the, the ground limited test ban moved. treaty, we went to underground wow. testing. And tests were done anywhere from 600 feet to 2,000 feet underground. Oh man. The United States used dig. Oh my god. In all, the United States has done 1,054 nuclear weapons tests, and of that, 928 of those were done here at the Nevada test site. 900 were done at the Nevada test site. Walker. And six nukes are unaccounted for. They're just missing. Yeah, it could be anywhere. Oh, Sarah has the news. Okay. <laughs> They're in the same hands, though. Whoa. This music really fits the tone. Saddest activity. <laughs> <laughs> to come out here, it's as simple as, as just providing us with some very basic information. We'll bring you out here in a bus and we'll tour you the 200 miles that you'll drive in a day seeing the sights of this piece of property that's larger than the state of Rhode Island. Wow. Yeah, so the United States is bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we are the empire. We are the Death Star. Okay, so we're, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. I can't wait to eat the rich. God damn it, Caboose. My favorite video was the one about the nuclear family that ended up just being anti-Chinese propaganda. <laughs> that, that was outstanding in all the wrong ways. <laughs> How did that happen? Like, oh my god. It was like it was going somewhere, and the way, where it went was just not great. It was not great. Oh, my God. Okay, so we have um, Clydeson, who is on. We have the Antifada. Do we like the Antifada? Please raid a Minecraft runner and radicalize their chat. Oh my god. I'm scared. I don't know who to raid uh, on the Minecraft. Who do you watch, Sarah? But they say I'm a tanky. Oh, oh I'm a tanky. Yeah, I'm a tanky. <laughs> yeah, I'm a tanky. We're riding that tank, mowing down the fucking snowflakes. Nice. 
Who do we see? Do we see anyone who we want to raid? Should we try the Antifada? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know any anything about Twitch. Oh my God! You're a Twitch streamer now. Get with the get with the fucking program. <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> I'm not a Twitch streamer. I, you I are a Twitch. On a Twitch stream sometimes. No, you are a <laughs> fucking Twitch streamer, and you must learn the craft. I reject Twitch culture. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. Well, we love you. Thank you for being here, everyone. We appreciate your time and you spending it here with us. Have a good night or day. <laughs> night. Yeah. Communism will win. That's Absolutely. right. Surrender. We're not gonna shoot you. They want to re-educate you. What is this you video? see, son, you're just the product of an alienated economic class, lashing out because you feel powerless and un oh shit, disenfranchised by the bourgeois power structure. That's right. I stole a car. I'm a thief. Well, son, if you think about it, all property is theft. <laughs> what is that from?